Hello, I'm Cliff Lobby, the Public Programs Director here at the FDR Presidential Library, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for this session titled Myths and Realities of American Responses to the Holocaust, 1938 to 1945. This session is part of our 2021 virtual conference examining American responses to the Holocaust digital possibilities hosted by both the Roosevelt Institute and the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. While this session is being streamed live and recorded and will later be posted on FDR Library's YouTube account, only registered attendees are able to participate in discussions. So registrants, please type your questions in the Q&A tab that's to the right of the screen so that our moderator can pose them to the panelists throughout the presentation. I want to give a quick rundown of the code of conduct for this conference, and it's very simple. Um, dialogue must be civil, respectful, and focused on Holocaust studies and digital humanities. Uh, personal attacks, profanity, and hate speech will not be tolerated, and violators will be blocked. And any links or content that's not direct, directly related to the conference will be removed. So now it is my pleasure to turn things over to our moderator for this session. He is the Michael H. and Deborah K. Rubin Presidential Chair of Jewish History and Director of Jew the Jewish Studies Program at Wake Forest University, Barry Trachtenberg. And turn it over to you now, Barry, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cliff. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this panel on myths and realities of American responses to the Holocaust 1938 to 1945. It's my honor to moderate this panel. I'll take just a few minutes to introduce it and our speakers, and I ask that you all be patient with me and the panelists as we navigate this platform. Uh, so I imagine, as most of you know, the history of the United States and the Holocaust is one that has often elicited intensely strong feelings and opinions, some of which, but not all, are directly related to opinions over the United States' actions or lack of them on behalf of European Jewry during World War II and the years leading up to it. As with other scholarly debates that spill over into public view, such as those that occurred at the beginning of my graduate days, my graduate student days over the Smithsonian's 1995 exhibition that re-examined the US bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or the very more recent debates over the 1619 Project. The history of the US and the Holocaust is one that speaks as much to concerns about our own time as they do the time in which they, they occurred. Such lasting historical myths, such as that the atomic bombings were unquestionably necessary in order to end the war, that slavery and racism aren't embedded into the history and structure of the United States, and the one before us, the ongoing myth about the near complete US inaction in response to the Holocaust, are ones that persist not because they're firmly grounded in some sort of historically verifiable truth, but because they seem to speak to a set of particular needs of those who hold them and insist upon them and sometimes seems to lose their mind over them. Speaking of another far more insidious and persistent myth, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is now experiencing something of a rebirth in the age of QAnon, Hannah Arendt famously warned us, quote, that if a patent forgery like the Protocols is believed by so many people that it can become the text of a whole political movement, the task of the historian is no longer to discover a forgery. Certainly it's not to invent explanations which dismiss the chief and, and political and historical facts of the matter that the forgery is being believed. This fact is more important than the historically speaking secondary circumstance that it is a forgery. I think about this challenge by Arendt a lot, and I've sought in my own writing to try to understand why the myth of US total indifference to Jewish suffering persists into the present to the point where there are those who have dedicated much of their professional lives to sustain it. Some have argued that this myth is propped up on account of either the political, material, or social benefits that such a myth accrues to those who maintain it. My own work has explored its uh, racial aspects. But Arendt wasn't a historian, and as historians, we must continue that work that she identifies as the secondary task, that of disproving the myth through sustained historical research. It's up to historians to do the deep investigative work that demonstrates that a historical understanding that was cemented into Americans, and especially American Jewry's consciousness well over 30 years ago, is one that continually needs to be reevaluated and reconsidered, and whose foundations have long since cracked. This is what our three distinguished speakers, Richard Brightman, 
Rebecca Erbelding and Meredith Hindley bring to us this afternoon in their presentations. Our format to today is we'll hear from each of our three presenters whom I'll introduce before they speak. Then I will pose some questions to start off all the, our discussion and then I will turn to your discussions, which you can write into the Q&A in order to keep the conversation going. So we'll, we'll start with Richard Brightman, whose paper is entitled U.S. Reaction to Kristallnacht, Now and Then. Richard Brightman is the author or co-author of 13 books and many articles in German history, U.S. history, and the Holocaust. The book FDR and the Jews, co-authored with Alan J. Lichtman, won the 2013 National Jewish Book Award in American Jewish Studies and was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in History. His latest book, The Berlin Mission, The American Who Resisted Nazi Germany from Within, was published by Public Affairs in late 2019. Brightman is Distinguished Professor Emeritus at American University. He received his BA from Yale and his MA and PhD from Harvard. He lives in the Washington, D.C. area. Please, Professor Brightman. Thank you for that nice introduction, Barry. And uh, I want to thank Paul Sparrow, Abby Gondek, Cliff Lauby, and the wonderful staff at the Roosevelt Library for running this conference under challenging circumstances. Um, it is a myth that Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, uh, occurred over the course of only one night, but that's not the myth I want to um, question uh, today. Um, I'm dealing with uh, US responses to the Holocaust. And I've seen um, a bunch of uh, sources, sermons, um, academic papers, uh, and human rights statements, um, in effect arguing that the United States had a chance to stop the Holocaust before it began by denouncing what was a very public uh, event, the destruction of some 1400 synagogues across uh, Germany and Austria, Jewish shops, uh, and the rounding up of 30,000 Jewish men uh, and sending them to concentration camps. Um, some people have said if if we in the United States had said more and done more, um, the Nazis would not have proceeded. I think this argument is fundamentally uh, mistaken uh, for three different reasons, uh, which I will outline first and then uh, give you some of the evidence uh, backing up my uh, uh, argument, my counter argument. I don't think there is enough examination of exactly what um, the Roosevelt administration did at the time. Uh, I think that the judgment, uh, the moral judgment made is based on today's conditions and standards rather than uh, the standards of the time. And I think um, that um, this argument um, misjudges uh, the repercussions of further um, public denunciations of Nazi Germany. So, um, let me um, trace some of the facts, but before I do that, uh, I'd like to have uh, Alex um, share the screen, uh, share a document with you for a moment with some of the details about what the United States government did in the period between November 11th, 1938, uh, two days after Kristallnacht and um, roughly Thanksgiving uh, of 1938. Please skim this. <clears throat> 
Thanks, Alex. Um, I, I don't expect that you will have absorbed all of this, uh, but uh, perhaps this list at least suggests uh, that the Roosevelt administration, uh, both the president personally and some of uh, the top uh, cabinet members were doing something uh, in response to Kristallnacht. And uh, all of us will be happy to take questions afterwards about uh, any of the details. So um, let me uh, go through some of the key uh, facts that we need to take account of in judging what was and was not possible. Um, the United States recalled its um, ambassador from Germany. Uh, it wasn't formally called a recall, but it was a return to the United States for consultation. At the time, this was considered to be a strong rebuke of Nazi Germany. And in fact, the United States, I believe, was the only country to bring its ambassador home in a reaction uh, to Kristallnacht. It is a fact that Hitler and the Nazi regime bitterly resented this criticism and um, an SS uh, periodical responded by uh, publishing a cartoon of Franklin Roosevelt side by side with lynching of African Americans uh, as its way of saying, who are you to criticize us? Uh, it could have led Germany to break off relations with the United States entirely. And that would have been quite unfortunate because um, the immigration quota for Germany in November uh, 1938 and subsequently was essentially filled. Um, that quota amounted for Germany and Austria to 27,370 people. And um, there were Americans who wanted German Jews and others to get out under that quota. If Germany broke off relations, um, those people would not have been able to get out. With Ambassador Wilson gone from Berlin, uh, the man who essentially ran both the embassy and the consulate general uh, was a man named Raymond Geist, had a position in both the consulate general and the embassy. He was the one in charge of uh, supervising the uh, immigration quota. Geist had been in uh, Germany since the end of 1929. Uh, he had built up extraordinary sources within uh, Nazi Germany. And he had become first informally and then more or less formally a kind of intelligence analyst before the United States had uh, a professional intelligence organization. He had been warning his contacts in Washington uh, since 1934 that Nazi Germany was uh, a danger to all of Western civilization. Immediately or within weeks of Kristallnacht, um, Geist wrote two long letters to two of his superiors with dire warnings about the immediate future. I can give you snippets of those warnings here. Uh, longer versions appear in my book entitled The Berlin Mission. 
to George Messersmith, who was Assistant Secretary of State, but whom Geist knew very, very well because Geist had served under Messersmith when Messersmith was in Berlin a few years earlier. To George Messersmith, Geist wrote that the um, refugee, International Refugee Committee established by the F, uh, Evian Conference might accomplish something in negotiations with Nazi Germany if uh, they tried a low key visit to Berlin and Geist said he would be happy to assist them. And he ultimately did. Um, but they should not try to um, get a lot of publicity out of this visit because that was the last thing that the Nazi officials wanted. Geist said that he could not disapprove of condemnations of Nazi Germany because no condemnation was too strong for what had been done uh, to German Jews. But he feared that if the United States uh, condemned Nazi Germany again, after uh, one of Roosevelt's statements in mid-November, uh, that the Nazis would just take out their vengeance upon uh, German Jews. If the United States, Geist wrote, uh, wanted to uphold the principles of justice and human dignity, then it needed to go all the way and declare war on Germany and fight a war to the finish. But if it was not prefer, prepared to do that, then Geist said it was better to take a low key approach. And Geist said they have embarked on a program of annihilation of the Jews, and we shall be allowed to save the remnants if we choose. Messersmith was a pro-Roosevelt uh, assistant secretary of state, and Geist knew what tone to take with him. Wilson, the recalled ambassador, was um, more or less a Republican isolationist whom the Nazis liked a lot. Uh, and Geist knew he had to take a different line of argument with Wilson. But it was some of the same uh, warning and even a little bit more in the way of specifics in Geist's letter to Wilson on December 5th, 1938. They are intending, as I hear from my friend, Dr. Best, Dr. Best, the number two man in the Gestapo, to bring the Jewish situation to a close as rapidly as possible. They are intending to impose all the restrictions and hardships possible so that the Jews, I'm skipping, will inevitably perish. The Germans are determined to solve the, Jew, the Jewish problem without the assistance of other countries, and that means eventual annihilation. To both of them, Messersmith and Wilson, Geist said, let me see what I can do privately, but please don't criticize the Nazi regime publicly. And privately, Geist did warn Hitler's military adjutant that another Kristallnacht would result in the United States breaking off relations with Germany. He had no authority to make that threat, but he did it anyway. And we know he did it, not only because he wrote Messersmith that he had done this, but... Um, in a uh, one dimension of the negotiations between the uh, Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees and Nazi officials, uh, one of the basic principles laid down by the US 
international uh, side was that there should not be another Kristallnacht. So um, this was Geist's expert opinion at the time. The relations continued, it, not only until the start of World War II, uh, but beyond that. Immigration continued. And in fact, in the following uh, fiscal year, the immigration quota was also very close to being filled. And uh, that's about 50,000 people uh, who got out because the United States did not keep publicly denouncing the Nazi regime. You can agree or disagree with Geist's opinion, but he um, watched Hitler over a 10 year period and I'm not going to fight with his expert view. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Richard. Thanks very much. Uh, our next speaker is Rebecca Erb Belding. Dr. Belding is a historian of American responses to the Holocaust and author of Rescue Board, the untold story of America's efforts to save the Jews of Europe, winner of the 2018 National Jewish Book Award for writing based on archival material. She's also a historian, archivist, and curator at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Her talk is entitled The Last Boat, The Impact of Encroaching War on Refugee Immigration to the United States, 1938 to 1941. Take it away, Dr. Belding. Thanks so much, Barry, and thanks so much, Richard. This, this actually dovetails really well on what I'm about to talk about, which is how the U.S saved the remnant and the way that the war impacted this, this saving. Um, so it really takes off. And I'm gonna echo a little bit about what, of what Barry said at the beginning. Um, public understanding of American response to the Holocaust is full of myths and misconceptions as, as this panel is based on. Um, this is not often the result of malice or poor education, but instead we have these persistent tropes, these metonyms, that serve as receptacles for our moral outrage related to American response to the Holocaust. Our, our failure to rescue uh, or to really welcome Jewish refugees in the 1930s or to prioritize the rescue of Jews um, once the allies learned of the final solution. And you see this in opinion columns and editorials and newspaper columns and memes on social media where people toss out references to the St. Louis or more generally all of the ships that were turned back um, to the United States, which is it, in itself an error, um, or that the US didn't even bomb the camps, um, a reference to the 1944 request for the allies to bomb the rail lines leading to or the gas chambers and crematoria at Birkenau. Um, the St. Louis and the bombing of Auschwitz are often used as shorthand for this overall argument about American indifference to refugees and unwillingness to consider aid to suffering civilians as part of the criteria for American entry into war. And these arguments aren't completely wrong. In the 1930s, American officials did strictly enforce existing anti-Semitic, racist, xenophobic immigration laws. Um, there was no asylum or refugee policy. The Allies consistently prioritized fighting in World War II over humanitarian aid um, to Jews, even after it became possible to provide more assistance. And the fact that the St. Louis story is told, mistold and misremembered um, is something that can be expected when discussing a history as emotional and enraging as the Holocaust. So the emotions can be true, even when the facts are not. The problem with this is that if we ignore facts or deem them irrelevant, if this metonym serves the purpose of a present day historical argument or comparison that we wanna make, we are treading on very thin ice. Divorced from time and place and fact, the St. Louis story and the St. Louis as a political argument can be used to justify anything. And the passengers who were real people with robust and complicated lives as rich as our own are reduced just to political pawns. And I wanna begin this talk this way because I'm specifically discussing the impact of World War II on Jewish refugee immigration to the United States. And my argument can be very clearly and easily misinterpreted. Numerous factors undoubtedly made it incredibly difficult to immigrate to the United States. 
including a restrictive US immigration policy. But that restrictive policy did not cause the Holocaust, nor did the vast majority of Holocaust victims ever have the opportunity to explore immigration. So by default, I'm talking about Jews in Central and Western Europe, areas where immigration was much more of an option than in Eastern Europe, due in part to the restrictive immigration quotas that significantly limited immigration from Eastern Europe, but also due to the way that the Holocaust and the war happened there, it was nearly impossible for those people to immigrate to the United States, unless they were going to cross the Soviet Union, get to Japan, and from there to San Francisco. And a few people did do that. But for most people, if the United States was their intended destination, they were boarding a ship, crossing the Atlantic, and landing in New York. If you watch social media or even some news outlets, you might share the impression that I mentioned before, that the US turned away dozens of ships carrying Jewish refugees, of which the St. Louis was the most famous example. In fact, every ship carrying Jewish refugees holding US immigration visas was accepted into the United States. The passengers on the St. Louis did not have any US immigration paperwork. They had Cuban landing permits and they were turned away from Cuba but not accepted in the United States or any other haven in the Western Hemisphere because they didn't have the legal paperwork necessary to allow them to land. And no country was willing to make an exception to their immigration laws. There was no mechanism, as I said, for people to claim asylum. And when the US Holocaust Memorial Museum began planning an exhibition on American response to the Holocaust, our exhibit had to include the story of the St. Louis. And and unfortunately, a, a case of artifacts from passengers on board, which was the easy answer, that would only have reinforced the idea among our visitors that this was an example of many ships that had been turned back. So we had to think of a different way to do this. We instead came up with the idea of a map, and you can see this is a picture of the gallery. You can see the map um, kind of in the center of your screen in the back. Um, a map showing all of the ships that were leaving Europe, bringing self-identified Jewish refugees to the United States with the St. Louis story embedded therein. I was the historian on the project and responsible for this research. Since the exhibit is open, the data behind the map is available to anyone who is interested in it, and I'm happy to share it because there is so much more data and so much more information that we could glean from the data that we came up with for this project. First, to do this, we needed to make a list of all of the ships uh, leaving Europe and arriving in the United States between March 1938, when the Nazis annexed Austria, and the beginning of the refugee crisis, um, and October 1941, when Nazi Germany issued a decree forbidding Jewish immigration from its territories. The New York Times had a column, um, a daily column, usually embedded in the later part of the newspaper, entitled Shipping and Mails, um, reporting all of the arriving and forthcoming passenger cargo and mail ships that were arriving in New York, the ones that had arrived the previous day and the ones that were anticipated over the next week. So international mail at this time traveled by ship and so did your Aunt Ida coming back from her vacation. And this newspaper column was a way for you to figure out what the weather had been like impacting the ship's arrival. Um, so you knew when to drop off your mail, when to pick up your family member, um, when to meet important people and packages, you would consult this column. So we made a list of all of the ships arriving from Europe and cross-checked this list with shipping manifests and other news reports. So if it didn't show up, a certain vessel didn't show up on the shipping and mails column, it was still counted and included in our, all of our analysis. But this column really gave us a good starting point for the research. Between these two dates, March 1938 and October 1941, 2,862 such ships arrived in New York directly from Europe. And just looking at the sheer numbers, we can see the, war, the way the war impacted um, shipping and the huge drop after war began in September 1939. In the final 10 months of 1938, 1,178 ships arrived to New York from Europe in the first 10 months of 1941, it had dropped to 122. Shipping manifests give a wealth of information about arriving immigrants, including names, what kind of visa an immigrant held, their closest relative who is still in Europe, where the person lived, um, and where they intended to go upon arrival into the US. And often this is 
a way to begin to figure out who the immigrants American financial sponsor might have been. Um, but the manifest also pr uh, provides another piece of information, which is race. Arriving immigrants had to self-select from one of 46 racial categories. Choices included Italian North, Italian South, Herzegovinian, Bohemian, Moravian, uh, Dalmatian, and crucially, Hebrew. So that changed in 1943 um, when the US immigration system looked around and said, well, maybe the United States should not classify Jews as a race. Uh, that seems to be what the Nazis are doing. Um, and this decision actually in 1943 resulted in some debate because the Hebrew designation was the way that Jewish aid organizations um, were able to quantify how many Jews were actually arriving in the US. Anyway, by taking the long list of ships and then going into ancestry.com, um, we could see how many self-identified Hebrews immigrated to the United States between March 1938 and October 1941 for and on each ship. We can't say that all of them were escaping Nazi persecution, but pretty much most undoubtedly were. Um, and of course, we can't assume that everybody um, fleeing Nazi persecution would have identified themselves as Hebrew, either because they didn't think understandably that it was a good idea for them to announce that to their new government, or because they didn't consider themselves Jewish. Um, Non-Aryan Christians who were persecuted as Jews by the Nazis, but did not consider themselves religiously Jewish, um, probably would have put something like German, another acceptable racial category. Between March 1938 and October 1941, 110,960 self-identified Hebrew immigrants left Europe and arrived in New York on 1,287 ships. For our purposes, I'm gonna to refer to these people as refugees, though again, the US had no refugee policy. These people were coming as immigrants and under the very slow deliberate immigration system. Some ships carried just a few Jews, um, and there are a few cargo ships that consistently sold berths off to just a few Jewish refugees each voyage. And that's something that I think is worth looking into in the future. What made those ships different or the captain different? Um, the largest number of refugees uh, you know, on one ship sailed on the Navamar in September, 1941, when 805 Jewish refugees arrived in New York. There's a trope in the title of my paper that I haven't talked about yet, this idea of the last ship. Um, that is usually a figure of speech, although the children and grandchildren of survivors often assume it to be fact, um, that indicates how close a refugee felt they had been to um, being stuck in Europe. Um, of course, there is no way a refugee would have known had, that their boat had been the last boat um, from a particular port or from Europe in general. Um, but there is no last boat. There is no final ship from Europe. Lisbon remains a port of departure throughout the war. Um, so, but there are final ships from many different ports as they shut down. Since the immigration process is often understood through testimonies and through collections of individuals, um, many of whom claim to be on this so-called last ship, the question of how the war physically impacted people's escape um, was still up in the air. And as it turns out, and as you can probably assume, the war had a massive impact on people's ability to escape. As soon as Nazi occupiers invaded a specific area, ports in that country shut down to US bound passenger transportation, even though the US was neutral for the entire period that we were looking at. So just to give you a sense, let me find my mouse again if I can, nope. Um, this is what 1939 looks like. So you can see that there are ships leaving from all over Europe, dozens of ships carrying hundreds, maybe a thousand people per month immigrating to the United States, again, coming from all over Europe. When we go to 1941, this is what it looks like three years later. There are only a few ships coming per month, almost all of them from Lisbon or from Spain, Almost all of the other ports in Central and Western Europe have been closed to US bound transportation because they're now under Nazi occupation or the occupation or are one of the Nazi collaborating countries. Therefore, the last ship out of Hamburg, the Washington, 
carrying 54 Jewish refugees left on August 22nd, 1939, and it arrived in New York the day before the war began. And at that point, the port from Hamburg shut down. The last port boat from Rotterdam prior to the Nazi invasion of the Netherlands and the closure of that port from which 17,229 uh, refugees had left over the course of two years was the Volendam. The Volendam sailed on April, not, um, I'm sorry, April 5th, 1940, bringing 356 Jewish refugees to the United States. The war also had a serious impact on the number of passenger vessels that could make the voyage, even if the ports had been opened. Uh, the Queen Mary was the fastest ship at sea. It could cross from Southampton, stop in Cherbourg, and arrive in New York in five days. Um, between March 1938 and the beginning of the war, the Queen Mary carried 6,211 Jewish refugees over 34 different voyages. It was on its way to New York when the war broke out. The British held it in port in the United States and then turned it into a troop ship. When Nazi Germany invaded the Netherlands, aerial bombings over the port at Rotterdam set fire to the Stadendam, and that fire spread to the Veendam at the next dock. Those ships were both destroyed, um, and between those two ships, they had carried 7,627 refugees to the U.S. over 33 trips. By the summer of 1940, with ports in Germany, Poland, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Northern France shut down to US bound transportation. Lisbon became the major port of departure. Prior to June 1940, records show us that only four Jewish refugees immigrated to the US from Lisbon. Between June 1940 and October 1941, 11,249 did so. And that is why in the movie Casablanca, and in the history that Meredith is going to talk to you about, Victor Laszlo and Elsa have to get exit visas to Lisbon. Um, it's pretty much the only port of departure for the United States. And so for prospective refugees in continental Europe, travel to Lisbon and the booking of a ship ticket in general had become now the most difficult part of the immigration process. After September 1939, American consular officials required refugees to have a ship ticket prior to being issued an immigration visa. You had to prove that you could get out before you could get a visa. Um, and, but even with an immigration visa, obtaining the entry and exit paperwork and transit visas in the right order to all of the countries that you would travel through to get to the boat and the boat ticket, um, remained precarious and stressful. Borders were opening and closing all the time. In December 1940, the U.S. actually canceled the waiting list for Germany. Um, instead, if you were trying to get out and you had a ship ticket um, and you had all of your paperwork in order, the consular officials would expedite your interview so that you could make your ship and get out. Um, this state of affairs lasted until 1941 when U.S. consulates in Nazi-occupied territories and Italy officially shut down. And so we lament how difficult the immigration process was paperwork-wise um, and the lack of interest in U.S. bureaucracy on really making it that much easier. Um, but we can also rightfully be surprised on the number of people who actually did manage to make it and to immigrate to the United States. While the last ship is a metaphor, the idea that the refugees experienced a near escape, something that can now be quantified through this research, is a very real thing. Um, so I am very looking, very much looking forward to uh, your questions when we're done. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Our last speaker is uh, Dr. Meredith Hindley, a writer and historian living in Washington, D.C., and author of Destination Casablanca, Exile, Espionage, and the Battle for North Africa in World War II. Her scholarship has also appeared in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Intelligence and National Security, and as part of an edited collection, Bystanders to the Holocaust, a Reevaluation. She's also written for Humanities in the New York Times, Washington Post, Times, Salon, Daily Beast, Christian Science Monitor, Long Reads, and Barnes & Noble Review. She holds her PhD in History from American University. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Meredith Hindley. Please. Thank you for that kind introduction, and I'm so pleased to be here today um, on this panel with um, both Rebecca and with um, Pritchard in particular, whose research I have benefited from and respect so much along with having the opportunity to um, finally get to engage with Barry. Today, I want to talk about, essentially, um, my presentation dovetails very nicely with Becky's. Um, if you looked at the, um, the 
the visualization that she had on her screen very at the very very bottom was this lonely little thing was this lonely little spot on the map in Africa it's like Casablanca um, and so today I would like to talk about uh, the role that Casablanca pay, played in the refugee trail and also its role as a mo in our popular culture because it is such a touchstone and it has come to define in many ways what we think about the refugee experience and how we view uh, what it meant to get out. Um, like the St. Louis, it's one of those things when you talk about what it meant to get out of Europe, people immediately think about um, Casablanca and everybody comes to Ricks and the um, duplicity of the Vichy regime. So um, Alexandra, are you there? Can you start my slides? Great, you can go to the next one. Um, so, um, obviously, um, so Casablanca is a movie that comes out in 1942, November, in November, 1942, Warner Brothers actually rushed it into the theaters because of Operation Torch, which is the American invasion of French North Africa in November. Um, but the movie is sort of was percolating along and the film, the screenwriters were pulling from stories that they had heard about refugees. Um, and their experiences. And so in a sense, it's a mashup of a lot of things that were floating around in the cultural milieu and, and among from Jewish refugees in Hollywood as well. Um, and so, but let's talk about what it actually meant to be in Casablanca and how one got to Casablanca and the role of the American consulate there. Um, could you, next slide please. So where is Casablanca and what, um, Casablanca is actually in French Morocco at this point. Um, the uh, Kingdom of Morocco was divided up into uh, two separate territories in 1912. French North Africa control, sorry, Fran France controls the lower three fourths of French Morocco and they get control of Casablanca. They are very upset that the Treaty of Fez does not allow them to have Tangier which was then the largest port on the Atlantic in Africa. So France goes about and it decides to create a massive trade port in Casablanca. And the city becomes a boom town. Alexander, next slide. And go one more, sorry. This is Casablanca in 1940. Um, you can see the port. Um, up in the upper uh, one quarter of your screen on the right. Um, the left side is the Medina, which dates from 1400s. And then stretching out below is the white city, which was built by the French. So Casablanca is controlled by the French, which is very important for what's about to happen. Um, next slide. In the spring of 1940, uh, Hitler invades, Hitler and Nazi Germany troops invade Europe, Western Europe. And it forces a massive refugee uh, um, scramble um, as Germ Nazi Germany invades. And when France finally falls, it creates a massive um, influx and exodus of refugees to the south and also to the southeast. As people are trying to stay ahead of the invading German armies, they're trying to avoid becoming um, under the boot of Nazi Germany. They're worried about what's coming. And this is particularly the case for those who have sought sanctuary and solace in Paris um, since the advent of Nazi Germany. Paris had been home to Jews. It had been home to communists and other political refugees who had thought that France could be a sanctuary and a way to escape um, the policies of Nazi Germany only to find that Nazi Germany has come to them. Next slide. So from Paris, what would happen is that um, the refugees would go um, southwest to Bordeaux. They would go southwest to Marseille. From Marseille, um, hopefully you could get a boat out. Um, if you could, um, refugees often then went across the Mediterranean to Algiers. 
or to Oran or to Casablanca. From Algiers, some refugees would take the train. It's a 24 hour train ride from Algiers to Casablanca. Um, but the problem is that if you went across to Algiers or to French Morocco, you were still under the control of Vichy France. Because as part of the armistice, Nazi Germany agreed that Vichy could control the colonies in North Africa. That means that you were essentially escaping to a different version of Vichy. And with it, the same policies that you were trying to escape by leaving France. So the refugees who find themselves in Casablanca in the summer of 1940 are about to find themselves under the boot and the policies of Vichy France. They are hoping that they might be able to get out, but they still have a problem, which is that they have to leave and they need ships. But in the summer of 1940, the port of Casablanca is completely swamped with ships arriving with refugees. And in fact, in June 1940, there are 200 ships that arrive off the port of Casablanca carrying refugees. And the response of French Morocco is to build an internment camp where they build outside of the city where they begin to process the refugees. And they begin to treat them like they are unwelcome, which is not surprising because they are often, they're considered to be um, politically suspect. They are um, also in many cases Jews. And more importantly, they're foreigners. So the American consulate. The American consulate in Casablanca, if we could go to the next slide. Thank you. The American consulate basically finds itself, well, overwhelmed in the summer of 1940. Um, at this point, the American consulate had been acting as the place where businessmen went to get help with um, their um, imports and exports. Um, Singer sewing machine, Douglas aircraft. Um, they're essentially, it's my, it, Casablanca at this point is kind of minor. The Americans don't really have a presence in Morocco in the way that, say, the British do or the Italians do. And the, um, the consulate is understaffed, um, and they are all of a sudden swamped by refugees. Um, the closest thing that exists to Rick's Cafe American is the waiting room in the American consulate. In the morning, 200 people would line, out, line up outside, hoping to get in, hoping for help. But they face the exact same sorts of roadblocks in terms of getting visas that Becky spoke about. Um, and the exact same issues with getting out in terms of there are no ships. Um, the American consulate also has another complication that adds to their workload, which is that because Vichy France controls uh, Morocco, uh, French Morocco, the American, the British consulate has left town. So has the South Africans, so have the Canadians, and so have the um, uh, Australians. And the Americans are now in charge of their consular affairs. So not only is the Amer this poor American consulate being besieged by um, hundreds and th thousands of refugees, but it also is now in charge of the portfolio of five other countries. So if you end up as a refugee in Casablanca, it's very difficult to leave. And despite the fact that the US consulate does what it can to help, and they do, they attempt to arrange, um, uh, they attempt to arrange passage across, um, across the ocean. They attempt to help them negotiate with um, shady sea captains. They try to help people sell their jewels um, with people who will actually give them good prices. They try and keep them, um, they try and keep young women from selling their virtue to nefarious sea captains for passage across. They do what good people um, should do in that situation, but they are overwhelmed and they are also in Casablanca, which is sort of on the edge of Europe and on the edge of the Atlantic and there's not much that can be done. And I'd like to share this quote with, um, we go to the next slide. I'd like to share this quote um, with, um, it's from Harold Gould, who is the Consul General in, the, in Casablanca in 1940. 
The American consulate in the city has been a club for hundreds of people who couldn't get into United States or Canada, but who came to tell us their stories to us and to each other. And I suppose it was one of the few places where they did not get a cold shoulder. And I do not regret that these forlorn harassed people felt that at our office, they could at least hear a friendly word, but they have nearly wrecked us. That's in a letter that Gould sends to the State Department describing conditions in Casablanca for that consulate. D asking, pleading for more staff, for more assistance, and for more visas to be open so that people can leave. Unfortunately, once you get to Casablanca, it's very difficult to leave. Um, and that has profound implications for the Jews that arrive. Um, you can go to the next slide. This is the uh, town square in Casablanca in front of the Hall of Justice in June of 1941. It's a ceremony to invest French veterans into a new sort of paramilitary unit that is operating in French Morocco. It's a striking image because you see all the men lined up committing themselves and Henri Pétain um, standing guard over them. It's a, in a three story poster. If you ended up in Casablanca and you ended up in French Morocco during the war, you would also be subjected to the anti-Semitic policies of Vichy France, because whatever policy was promulgated in Vichy France eventually made its way across the Mediterranean into Morocco. That meant that the same anti-Semitic legislation ended up in French Morocco. You had to identify yourself. You were permitted from practicing professions. You, um, in some cases, were forced to live in specific parts of the city. That was if you could avoid going to an internment camp or to a labor camp. And increasingly, refugees found themselves in that specific situation because they ran out of money. That's one of the things about being a refugee is that it costs money. It costs money to be a refugee. It costs money for a residency permit. It costs money to renew your residency permit. And then it costs money for all of the visas. And that is, that is completely separate from the, the American side of the equation where you have to show um, the ability to support yourself. You have to show um, financial um, viability. It's simply difficult to, to maintain yourself as a refugee. And such, many Jews ended up in internment and labor camps in French Morocco. Um, last slide. So I'd like to loop back around to the movie one last time. Um, the movie, of course, turns on, uh, the movie Casablanca turns on these, the papers, the papers that they need, that Laszlo and Ilsa need to leave Casablanca. They're actually, um, and they're, of course, a Hollywood invention, and they get them wrong because these are um, uh, transit visas signed by Charles de Gaulle, and in, well, if you had actually been found with anything signed by Charles de Gaulle on you, you would have immediately been arrested and um, sent to uh, an internment camp because you would have been considered a traitor and possibly a spy. But the papers that the movie, the, but the plot device is in fact a very real aspect of what it meant to be a refugee. Becky talked about the visas, how difficult it was to get the visas to line up. And she's exactly right, because there was no midnight flight to Lisbon, but there was a train to Tangier. And from Tangier, you would catch the plane to Lisbon or a boat. But in order to do that, it required an exit visa from French Morocco, a transit visa for Spanish Morocco, an entry visa for Portugal, and then another visa that would allow you permission to stay in Portugal um, while you booked your passage. So in a sense, the movie, well, it doesn't quite get it right. It gets the essence of what it meant to be a refugee right and how difficult it was to get all those things to line up. And on that note, um, I'd like to um, stop right here and um, thank the audience and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Meredith. This was a really wonderful presentation and, and all of them were. Um, uh, we have a little over half an hour for questions. So I would like to invite uh, uh, 
audience members to please submit their questions to the Q&A. We, we have uh, some so far, but I'll start with one question for each of you. Um, and then one question for all of you, maybe to think about as, as a group that's not sort of specific to your presentation. So for, for Professor Brightman, um, I had a question regarding your chronology. Um, I, we don't need to put it back up. I'll just read um, the November 15th. So a week after Kristallnacht um, at least began, and I'd like to maybe hear more about your argument of Kristallnacht as something lasting more than just the one night. Um, your, your, your note here says, at a press conference, FDR announced return of Ambassador Wilson, and you discussed the importance of that. Um, but then the second part of it, it says, issued condemnation of Germany, but endorsed the quota system. And I'm wondering if you could perhaps speak to that, about why was it necessary at that moment to endorse this quota system, which both on the one hand made it possible, uh, as uh, Becky showed in her presentation, for... Um, tens of thousands uh, of Jews to, to come into the United States o over the next several years, but also was, of course, a barrier in many ways to, to others from, from coming in. So could you perhaps talk a little bit about the sort of the necessity and why it was important for FDR in this moment to sort of uh, substantiate or verify the importance of the quota system? Thanks, Barry. Um, if you go to um, Roosevelt's press conference of November 18th, in that chronology, you will see that he also uh, announced that he was extending the visitors' visas yep. of 10 to 15,000 uh, Jews already in the US on visitors' uh, uh, visas. Uh, they were supposed to go back, but he said he, he could not, in good conscience, throw them out. Uh, in terms of the quota system, um, uh, this was something that an overwhelming number of or percentage of Americans uh, endorsed. And in fact, uh, some polls indicated that uh, a good number of Americans considered the quota system too generous. Uh, this was something that uh, politically was too difficult um, for Roosevelt to tackle, which was one reason why he was also uh, encouraging the emigration of Jews to Latin American countries. And there are some other uh, entries in that chronology showing that. Thank you. Thank you. For Becky, um, I had um, a couple questions for you. Um, the, the, the first has to do with, um, so, so the research that you, you did, and I really appreciate you kind of walking us through your historical method of, of identifying um, uh, potential refugees who we know weren't formerly refugees, but were immigrants under the system. And I'm wondering, since the exhibition came up in 2018, have you found more data in some ways that has sort of changed how you're understanding this period? Um, so have you, you, you've relied, it's, it seems, on the New York Times and, and Ancestry, but I'm wondering if, if as the exhibitions come up, people have viewed the exhibition, it's received feedback, critique, you've gotten response for it. Has, has anything changed there? And, and my second question has to do, and if not, that's fine, I'm just sort of curious, because um, I'm so fascinated by, by that method. And, and the second has to do with the idea of the last boat. And I'm sort of wondering if, if you are able to sort of trace when this notion sort of uh, began to be expressed in some ways that that people were coming on the, the very last boat because presumably as they're arriving, they also have the ability to, to know that, you know, they can open the New York Times and see that there's more ships coming the next day or the next week or the next month. So those passengers know at that moment they're not necessarily on the last boat, but certainly this idea comes in, in you know, part of, of, of our conception. Uh, for so many survivors, and one hears this all the time. So I'm wondering if you can sort of maybe trace some of that origins a little bit, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot too much, because I know this is outside of what you sort of presented, but... No, it's fine. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the museum's exhibit, there were a lot of things that we've learned since the exhibit has opened, but, yeah. but generally it's been about visitor behavior. Ah. You know, where, where do people stand? What do they look like? What do they look at? What do we need to re-emphasize because people were walking through a space and they're missing something important? And so we've made some adjustments to the actual exhibition gallery to adjust that, emphasize things that that it seems like people aren't getting. 
Um, and we've made some changes that are reflected in the online exhibition that aren't reflected in the gallery that I actually think um, in some cases improve the, the way in which we're telling the story. So there's a map towards the end of the exhibition, which I find is a very important map and one that I could have talked about here too, um, showing where the location of the major killing centers are and where the allied troops are. And what you see is how far away the allied troops are while the majority of, of victims are being murdered in the Holocaust. Um, it's, it's a reminder of the, the possibilities and the impossibilities of military intervention to stop the genocide as it was happening. Um, that got, we reinterpreted that for the online exhibition in part because in the gallery, it is a, I think a 22 by four foot screen. It's very hard to know where to look on this complicated map on a small map, you can draw the visitor's eye in different ways. Um, so, so in terms of the gallery, that those are the things that we've learned. In terms of the, the idea of the last ship, I have not done a lot of kind of end diagram research to figure out when that phrase first starts appearing in people's testimonies. Um, my, I would say educated guess is that we're looking at the late 70s early 1980s, when many survivors were asked to tell their stories for the first time. This is when the Holocaust is really starting to emerge in American public consciousness. And people are going back to relatives that they know escaped Europe and asking them to tell this story. And part of the story is how near your escape was, how um, a few pieces of chance and you might have also been stuck in Europe. Um, and so my assumption is that that is when that trope really starts to kind of take hold. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, and for, for for Meredith, I, I really appreciate your 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 deep history into to Casablanca and the sort of the the gap that exists between uh, where it rests in our popular imagination and the lived experience uh, uh, of that site for for refugees. And I'm wondering if in any of your research, you were able to come across how refugees themselves dealt with that gap. So, because I imagine when people find who had spent time in Casablanca, then eventually had an opportunity to leave, people's association with it was, oh, you must have had a great time, right? <laughs> or it must have been exciting, adventurous, right? Um, and of course, you know, uh, as you've shown, that wasn't that at all. So. Have you found any discussions among survivors' memoirs or in interviews or reports about how uh, those refugees actually contended with, with that gap between the expectations and realities of what it was like in Casablanca itself? Um, that's a fantastic question, and I wish I could say that I had, um, but rather, um, but, I, but I haven't. I mean, in a sense, when I do right, yeah. come across it, they talk about um, how, how quote-unquote foreign it was to them. Yeah. Um, because it was, I mean, it's a Muslim, it's a majority, um, it's a, ma it's a majority Muslim country. Um, there's only, um, there, the, there's a small European population. There's a small Jewish population. Um, the Jewish population is very diverse, um, because it's both Moroccan Jews and Sephardic Jews. Mm -hmm. and it's not, it's not Jews from Vienna. It's not Jews from Berlin. Um, it's a, um, so it's a different, it's a, um, it's the diaspora in a sense, and that the, that is also foreign to them as well. Um, so I haven't actually um, seen, I haven't actually run across that, um, but there, there's sometimes the, I was in Casablanca, um, and sort of there's that, sort of you can say that, but, um, but there is no glamour. I mean, there's no glamour to being a refugee. Yeah. Um, you might have had a better time as a refugee if you had connections. For example, um, uh, Sigmund Freud's daughter-in-law and granddaughter end up in Casablanca, and they end up living with a Jewish family. And um, she teaches. Uh, she's an audio uh, therapist. Um, and they had a somewhat um, nice life in Casablanca. But it is not going to a casino and gambling, and yeah. it's not um, um, doing. It's not anything particularly glamorous. It's sort of holding your breath and hoping that your visas will come in. Yeah, 
thank you so much. I, I, I do have some other questions uh, for for you as, as a whole, but um, uh, questions are starting to come from the panelists. So I would I would like to to turn to those um, if I can. Uh, the the first question that that's that's come asks about uh, New York and was New York the only city accepting immigrants and you know, and Becky in your in your presentation you you talked about New York as the site um, what about other cities such as Baltimore or Miami did they accept immigrants and um, if so or if not why not and if so how do we account for that in the research they do um, not nearly in the numbers just because New York was the was the most um, well-used passenger site. It is the place where most of the ships were coming in, just kind of in general. Um, there are a few ships that were included in our analysis that went to Baltimore, um, but I'm also I'm also looking at a records bias here. Mm -hmm. The ships arriving into New York, those manifests are almost all digital and digitized, as opposed to ships arriving in Seattle or in San Francisco, which are much more difficult to navigate. And so I would guess they're in the low thousands per year, the number of people coming into the West Coast. Um, but the majority of passengers and immigrants coming and arriving in the East Coast came in through New York. And so we do know that. Um, we know that both anecdotally and, and through data. And so that's why we focused on arriving in New York. It was simply the, the, the one that we could check with the most authority. All right, thank you. So it does point us to work still to be done, right? So all the graduate students out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, Becky, uh, I have a long list of uh, topics that graduate students could do if you yes. are interested in this topic. There are so many things. There's to be so covered. many. We can talk about that in a minute after we Absolutely. get. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, another question has come in. Says there was a reference to a major change in Nazi policy in late 1941 when Germany went from seeking to expel Jews to locking in Jews in Nazi-occupied Europe. Did the closed doors policy of the West have anything to do with this decision by the Nazis? Uh, Professor Brightman, would you like to start with this one? Uh, I'll take a shot. Um, Thank you. Um, I this does not um, work with the chronology of decision-making on the final solution. Um, and, um, you know, if, if you were to follow Raymond Geist, I'm not suggesting that everybody will, but, um, uh, you know, Hitler established his preference uh, not long after Kristallnacht and Nazi officials began to fight over the timing and ways and means in which uh, part or all of this could be done. I'm not going to say that there was a very early decision to carry out what we know as the, the Holocaust or the final solution, but uh, there was certainly movement in that direction very early. Yeah. And I would call the questioner's attention to um, a careful analysis of Hitler's speech of January 30th, 1939, uh, because uh, although Hitler mentioned the closed door policy of uh, the United States and Western countries, uh, just to pour scorn on people expressing sympathy for Jews, but not being willing to do enough, uh, he really didn't encourage negotiations with the West over getting German Jews out, in fact, he discouraged it, and he said that Europe needed a continent-wide solution at that point, and the only continent-wide solution that um, high Nazi officials were willing to uh, accept was uh, one of annihilation. I don't know if, if Meredith or, or Becky want to add anything to that. Um, I, I, would, I would also point to the fact that by... Um, the fall of 1941, we already see the openings of ghettos in the East. So there's already another sort of option in many ways for the for Nazi officials to contend with the Jewish population still in Germany. They didn't, of course, want to do the killings in front of other Germans who were non-Jews, but they had another way to sort of export that violence um, to the East. And we have obviously, you know, the beginnings of deportations um, in this time period. Um, and another question comes in, um, 
So understanding the distance between American troops and the killing centers suggests the question of why the killing centers weren't a higher priority for operations. So Becky, I'm going to send this one to you if I could, because I know you've contended with this question. Yeah, oh. and I actually want to poke at the question a little bit, the yeah, way that please. historians tend to poke. Um, this question assumes that Americans and American military officials knew where the killing centers are. This is, this is, I think, one of the things that we imply with the map, and, and perhaps erroneously, because many of the killing centers, their locations were actually unknown to the American military in 1941, 42, 43, as they're opening and as they are killing millions of Jews. So when you think about Helmno, Sobibor, Treblinka, and Belzhets, those were virtually unknown by the American military at the time. Um, when we're talking about killing centers becoming a high priority for operations, you're also contending with what our air range was. And it's really until the spring of 1941 that the American Army Air Force has a base in Foggia that has the ability to reach um, Nazi-occupied Poland and the extant killing centers there, which in that case was, was Auschwitz-Birkenau. Thank you. Um, another question's come in. Um, uh, and I'm going to combine a, a couple of questions here. This, this has to do, first of all, with a period of 33 to 37. Um, and wondering why did only 25% or so of the permissible visas were, were actually made available? Um, and um, to, to this questioner, um, you know, 25 uh, or 75% of, of those tragically went unused. And wonder if um, any of you would like to sort of comment on why that was. And then also there's a question specifically for Professor Brightman. Uh, in your opinion, why do you think Kristallnacht did not arouse greater demands from the American public to open the country's doors wider to Jewish refugees? So if someone wants I'll to start the, deal with the first part of that, perhaps from 33 to 37. Um, let me take the second one oh, first. Oh, sure, please. It's, it's easier. <laughs> um, Fair enough. This, um, as we have learned uh, in our own time, uh, attitudes towards immigration are often deeply entrenched. Uh, it's a hot button issue and it, it takes something uh, unbelievably uh, vivid and extraordinary to get uh, some people to change their views about immigration, uh, something abroad. Uh, that might affect uh, basic views toward immigration. And that um, leads me to the other question, which is, uh, and I don't have the percentage uh, in front of me, but I, let me assume that that 25% uh, figure is roughly correct. Um, why did that happen? Um, the United States had a immigration quota law but it also had immigration regulations. And those regulations changed fundamentally in 1930, which is before the Roosevelt administration, with um, President Hoover's decision to initiate strict enforcement of something called the public charge. Anyone uh, who was considered to be likely to become a public charge was deemed ineligible for an immigration visa. And under the economic conditions of the depression, anyone without independent wealth or relatives wealthy enough to support them, close relatives wealthy enough to support them, was considered to be likely to become a public charge. That um, step lasted a long time. There was a behind the scenes debate very early in the Roosevelt administration about loosening that requirement. But the State Department, uh, which um, contained uh, a good number of high officials who were restrictionist and some anti-Semites, um, did not want to loosen that, fought against it. Uh, some officials went to Congress where there were uh, plenty of isolationist supporters um, and restrictionist supporters. And um, ultimately, the Roosevelt administration did not do very much um, in its first term. And you can...
makes the change very specifically uh, to late 1936. After Roosevelt was reelected with a landslide, there were new instructions issued to consuls in Europe uh, saying basically that German Jews, uh, a good number of them would make good American citizens. They had relatives who were sincerely concerned about them. And the immigration numbers go up uh, from late 1936 uh, into 1938, at which point uh, the refugee situation becomes a, a real crisis and the quota gets filled. And that chronology is a very significant one. Of course, we need to also say that um, regulations could be made looser, but they could also be made tighter. They were, during the war, made tighter for different reasons. And again, um, there was there were a number of key State Department officials uh, who approved of that step, and some of them uh, were um, not only restrictionist, but also anti-Semitic. Thank you. Uh, Meredith and Becky, did you want to add to this? Okay. No. Oh, then I, I have two follow-up questions, if, if I may, um, which uh, draw from some of the other questions that have come in on, on these topics. Um, so to what extent, so with, with the unfilled quotas that, that exist prior to uh, 38, some of that is, in, in my sense, anyways, is a reflection of the fact that not every German Jew is interested in leaving um, Germany at this point. Um, and so I, I wonder if any of you would be interested in sort of speculating um, that if perhaps there wasn't the, the LPC, the license to, to be a, or likely to be a public charge proviso that restricted so many from coming in, if immigration was just was possible to as many German Jews who've wanted to go, to what extent do you think that the number would have been significantly higher prior to 1938? And the reason why I ask this question is, in my, in my own class on the Holocaust, we spend a lot of time talking about sort of what choices are available to Jews at, at different stages. Um, in Germany, in the, what we might think of as the more early years of the Nazi regime, and what we see is that there are there are many Jews who want to get out very quickly, right? Often young men, often foreign Jews, often Jews who have some political leanings that make them particularly vulnerable. But Jews who are somewhat more invested in their lives in, in Germany, meaning they, they own property, they're, they're breadwinners, they have family members who are ailing, who they're taking care of, aren't necessarily just running for the exits in, in the first few years. And then even after the Nuremberg Laws of 35, for, for many Jews, it seems as if it represents a period of stabilization where they, they believe, okay, this is the new reality, and then how do I sort of work within that? And I'm wondering, you know, sort of to what extent do you think this analysis is correct, sort of on my part in the speculation? And I'd love very much to hear your take on that. Whoever would like to, to weigh in. Becky, do you want to? Becky, I think you want to. Sure, please, yeah. I unmuted myself, which is the, the universal sign for I have something to say. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I think yes and no. I think your your speculation is right, and there are also a couple of things that I would poke at. Um, one, I think you're right that the vast majority of refugees in 1933 who are escaping Nazi Germany are going nearby. They're going to France. They're going to Belgium. They're going to the Netherlands. Otto Frank takes his family to the Netherlands. Whether they would have gone to the United States had that option be, been open to them, I think, is a speculation that is a butterfly flapping in the wing, its wings across the ocean. We have no idea what the ripple effect would have been had the US had open immigration at this point. Um, we do know that somewhere between 75 and 90,000 um, Germans were on the waiting list at that point between 1933 and 1937 um, to come to the United States. Consistently, it seems to have been the same people um, and what we know from State Department correspondence is that many of those people are on the waiting list voluntarily. They don't have their paperwork in order. They know they don't qualify, but they want to be on the waiting list in case they come into some luck, in case the U.S. changes its laws, that they will be ready and, and already on the waiting list to go. Um, David Wyman, the, the, um, one of the 
leaders of American response historiography who passed away a couple of years ago, wrote in his book, Paper Walls, that at the end of 1937, all active um, applications to the United States had been dealt with appropriately. People had been given their interview, they had pre presented their paperwork, they had gotten their visa or not. There is not an active waiting list, even though we know that there are about 90,000 on the waiting list, they're inactive at that point, not actively trying to get to the US. And so that complicates, I think, the situation a little bit Thank you. from what you were talking about. Yeah. Please. I'll uh, just add a, a brief note to that. Um, so we know that the uh, process of persecution in Nazi Germany during the 1930s was an irregular one, um, uh, escalating in general, but with periods where uh, there was a halt uh, uh, to escalation. And it was very difficult for German Jews to figure out um, what the future would hold, as you said in your question, even after the Nuremberg laws. Um, my sense of things uh, coincides with uh, Becky's, namely that there were enough people interested in getting out that they could have filled the immigration quota uh, for the entire 1930s. And so that 25 uh, percent figure is um, uh, really a wrenching uh, commentary on uh, regulations. Uh, uh, but you have a different situation uh, by 1938 after the Anschluss. Um, by the beginning of 1939, you have 300,000 German Jews on the waiting list. And so for every open slot, uh, you've got uh, many dozens of qualified people. And that pretty well guarantees that regardless of unfairness towards individuals, and there were undoubtedly uh, great injustices in individual decisions, um, the quota was going to get filled. There were just too many people uh, applying. So um, the LPC no longer mattered very much. Yeah. Thank you. Meredith, did you want to chime in on this? Um, the only thing I would add to, to it Please. is that um, the, this takes, uh, it takes money. It takes money to leave, which is something that we don't usually, we don't always talk about. Um, there's a difference between having the desire to leave and having the resources to leave. And that isn't always part of the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. We, we just have a few minutes left, so I'd like to pose a general question that draws from some of the other comments or questions that, that have arrived. I, I want to ask you a, a bit about how you approach this larger period and think about this larger period, because it seems as if we have two simultaneous truths existing, right? On the one hand, we, we have the fact that the United States did as much, if not more, than any other country to aid uh, refugees fr from Germany, from Nazi Europe. That's on the one hand, right? And so we, we can speak to what the United States did. And then there's on the other hand, right, had the, had the capacity, right, as we see with, with this, these unfilled quotas, to have done so much more, right? And I think very often when... Um, people begin to start challenging these dominant myths about this period by bringing in this moral ambiguity into the equation, we uh, get characterized as apologists, right? And to the, even to a point where we're told we're, we're sort of denying that the anti-Semitism was really the driving force behind all, all United States policies. So I'd like to, to ask you, how do you contend with this ambiguity with either your research or your, your teaching or, or, or your, your public writing? Um, and maybe we could do this in reverse order and start with, with Meredith. Um, um, it's a very good question. Um, it's one that um, I definitely have grappled with. And one of the things that I really look for is what was going on with the war? Because in the end, the war determines everything. Yes, you can have an anti-Semitic State Department person. Yes, you can have um, you can have an incredibly um, generous person in Casablanca helping refugees. 
But in the end of the day, it's the war. Can you get across the Atlantic? Are there ships coming? Um, are, can you get a visa? I mean, there are structural things that determine whether or not people can get out of Europe. And that's actually something that Becky and I talk about a lot in terms of like um, for graduate students. Um, there are all kinds of things that we don't know um, in terms of like, uh, in terms of logistics, um, in terms of um, what the possibilities are. And I think that that as we, is we if we want to talk about um, what was possible, we have to talk about what was happening with the war at that time. And that's kind of how I, because it's so easy, it's always where I end up, because it's so easy to have the emotional response and to have the outrage, which I absolutely do have. But I also have to be realistic about what was possible. And sometimes that is really difficult to square with what you would have wanted to have done. Thank you. Becky, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely echo Meredith that one of the things that has been needed in this field for a long time is putting the history of the war and the history of the Holocaust on top of each other. Um, that is something that, that again, has been missing. And, and I hope this conference helps move that forward. I also noticed in the chat that somebody asked whether we collectively were implying um, that the what the U.S. did was appropriate. And, and that is something that I feel like we go out of our way to stay away from. It is not my job to determine what is appropriate or not appropriate or to place moral judgments. My job is to give you the facts. I'm giving you the number of ships. I'm giving you the number of immigrants. I am an archives rat. I am going to go through every single document, turn every page, um, and hopefully explain what happened and push against this, I, this um, idea that nuance doesn't matter. Nuance absolutely matters. It matters in the arguments that we make. It matters in the lived experience of the people who went through this history. And I feel like the way to honor them is to turn every page and to explain the context in which they were living and to not necessarily make my moral judgment the foreground. You Thank can you. read my writing and have your own moral judgment. Thank you. And I'm keeping an eye on the time. So uh, Richard, I'll ask if you could keep your response quite brief, because I know that Cliff needs to come back in and I see the clock ticking down on us. I will keep it very brief. Thank you. I agree Sorry. with both Meredith and Becky. <laughs> um, I, I would say that um, a lot of people who um, want us to condemn um, American responses to the Holocaust are thinking um, basically in terms of the United States in the late 20th or 21st centuries. And they think that the United States had a lot more options and leverage uh, than it did um, in the 1930s and the 1940s. The United States had no offensive military capability until sometime in 1942 and only a small one then. And in terms of military operations, uh, you know, it, it just was not um, even remotely um, possible to do anything until 1944 with regard to the Holocaust. You can get a debate about what might have been done in 1944, but not earlier. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to thank uh, our panelists and thank our attendees uh, for your, your fascinating questions. And thank you all for this wonderful session. And I'll turn it back over to you, Cliff, for the last 45 seconds. Thank you. Sorry. That was a fantastic panel. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm here to um, plug shamelessly plug our next program. Um, and uh, I hope that you'll all uh, come back at 7 p.m. I'm going to try to share my screen here. And I just I want to draw your attention to the 7pm program uh, right here and you can find it in the up next section here in the uh, main stage area and um, it is a film screening of Soul Witness uh, with the director there for Q&A is moderated by uh, William Harris, our deputy director. The director of the film, uh, Harvey Bravman, will be there and will be taking um, questions. So uh, please join us at seven. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to um, everyone on the panel. It was a, a wonderful presentation.